we'll start the, the quarter talking about mechanical oscillations. And as I'll say in class, there's a wide variety of physical systems where you have oscillatory behavior. So what we'll talk about is very broadly applicable. But I'll start with a system that's the easiest to analyze mathematically, uh, and that's the ideal uh, spring with a mass on it. And this leads to a, a solution to the equations of motion called simple harmonic motion. So we'll start with that. Um, so again, the system we're going to analyze uh, will be mass on the spring. So I've got um, an applet here from your textbook um, that demonstrates this. Uh, so I have a spring here attached to a fixed point. Um, I've turned off gravity here, so this is as if it were you were looking down on a frictionless surface, um, horizontal surface. If I grab this mass um, and pull it back, so I stretch the spring. Uh, and let it go, there's going to be a force that pulls the mass back towards where I started. Okay, and an oscillation begins. And that's because, because the, the mass has inertia. Um, when it reaches back to the equilibrium point, it's moving with some velocity. Uh, so it doesn't stop. Um, basically, it continues on and compresses the spring. And when you compress the spring, there's a force back uh, in the downward direction on the, on the screen. Uh, and you get an oscillation that uh, continues. So we want to write down an equation that describes this oscillation. Um, so we'll, we'll use an ideal force law for this system. Well, let me draw the system first here. So if I have, um, I'm going to consider a wall and a frictionless floor. I'll attach a spring to the wall, and then I'll attach a mass to the spring. Okay. And the idea is if the uh, string is, uh, spring is unstretched, there's no force, everything sits still. Uh, to start the motion, what I can do is pull it off to the right. We'll call that the x direction, um, and then let it go. And I'll call the unstretched position the position where there's no force on the mass. Okay, uh, That's going to be the equilibrium location, or x equilibrium. Okay, um, So for this system, uh, for an ideal spring, I can write down a force as a function of the distance I stretch the spring. Um, it's uh, inversely proportional, or sorry, it's opposite the, the, the direction of the stretch, so it tends to be a restoring force, so there's a minus sign. Um, there's a constant of uh, proportionality, that's the, the spring constant, K. And it's linearly proportional to this distance of stretch. That's not just x. That's x minus this equilibrium location. Okay. Um, all right, so we can write down an equation uh, of motion for this. So we have f equals ma. Um, I'm going to write the acceleration, which is the second derivative um, of the position in time, just using dot notation. If you hadn't seen that before, every dot I put above the variable is a time derivative. So this is the second time derivative. And my force is now minus k x minus x equilibrium. Um, now I can do one of two things to get rid of x equilibrium. I can, you, you always have freedom to choose what your coordinate system is going to be. So your perfectly, you know, perfectly valid approach is to say I'm going to set make zero be the position of the equilibrium, um, and that'll work well in this case. You have to keep in mind that equilibrium position can change in other instances, and we'll, we'll treat a case like that in class, which is the vertical hanging spring. Um, but for now, we can say, let's set at x equilibrium to 0. Another approach is to just redefine your variable and say, my new variable x prime is equal to x minus x equilibrium. And I'll get the same equation that I'm going to write now, which is uh, just, and I'll divide through by m while I'm doing it, minus k over m x. Okay? And again, this is for, if you like, choosing my coordinate axis to be at the equilibrium point. Okay, so we know the solution to this equation is going to be periodic. We can see the motion here that we're trying to uh, describe. Um, and so uh, an ansatz, a guess for what the solution will look like, is to use sinusoidal functions. Um, and so any either cosine or sine would work to describe this. In fact, the, the solution would be a linear combination of the two. But I can write down um, a solution that works for any um, oscillating motion under this equation in the following way. Some amplitude a 
times cosine. I could pick sine if I wanted to, but I'll pick cosine. Omega t. Uh, and now I add another um, cof uh, another uh, parameter, which is the phase phi. Okay. Now omega here is the frequency of the motion. Um, the amplitude of the motion is given by a. That's the distance it travels during the oscillation. Um, and then phi is a coefficient to, to really get the initial condition right. And we'll come back to that. So this, really what it does is allows me to write a cosine plus uh, b sine as a cosine omega t plus phi. Okay. All right, so let's check our solution. We'll do that um, by taking derivatives. Let me go to the next page here. Um, all right, there we go. So uh, this first derivative of a cosine phi, a cosine omega t plus phi, um, the derivative of cosine is minus sine, and I pick up a, an omega out front from the omega t and the argument of cosine. Okay. Okay, so there's my first derivative. Of course, this is the, the velocity as a function of time of the solution. Um, so x double dot, I'll take another derivative, derivative of sine, it's just positive cosine, but I pick up another, excuse me, another um, uh, omega. Okay, and of course this is the acceleration as a function of time. And now if I look at this uh, x double dot, um, this is the same as minus omega squared times x. So this solution, um, this uh, function will solve my equation if um, omega squared is equal to k over m. Okay. So again, omega is the frequency of the motion. Um, and so this, this solution will work um, if the frequency is equal to uh, square root of k over m. Um, and so it tells me that the, the, how fast the motion happens, the frequency of the uh, oscillation, increases with the spring constant, k. That makes sense because the, the strength of the force uh, is proportional to k. So a, a stronger spring will ex exert a stronger force on the mass and pull it back more quickly, accelerate it more quickly. Um, it's inversely proportional to the mass, um, the square of the frequency that is. Uh, that makes sense because the heavier the object, the harder it is to ex to to make it move, to accelerate it. Okay, because uh, it goes the acceleration is the force over the mass. Um, so heavier object will will move slower with respo in response to the same force. Okay, and I can see that here in my animation. So I have a heavy mass here that's oscillating at a certain frequency. I'll take this lighter mass and pull it back about the same distance. Let it go. And you can see the oscillation is much faster in this case because the, the two springs here have the same spring constant, but the, uh, the mass is much lighter in the number three case. Um, and therefore, the acceleration is, is bigger for the same force. Okay. All right. So let's look a little closer at the solution. So I have these two coefficients, a and phi, in my solution. Um, and uh, where do they... Where do they come from? How do I assign them? Um, these two come from really the initial condition of this, the oscillation. Um, so, and again, the A is the amplitude. So A, let me plot it to help explain this. So if I have my solution, um, let's plot X versus time. Um, let me just pick a solution here. So let's... Um, Let's do this. So here's my cosine. Let me clean this up a little bit. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so there's an oscillatory motion. So the amplitude here is just the peak value of the function. Okay, again, cosine has a peak value of 1, so the, the um, maximum amplitude is A, the minimum amplitude is minus A. Um, the frequency um, is, you know, the, the, the 
it tells us how often it repeats itself. Okay, so if I take uh, one repetition of the motion here, it will be from the peak of the wave to the peak of the wave over here. Okay, and so this distance between the two in time, this is really the period of the motion t. Um, and so just to remind you, the um, the period is just uh, two pi over the frequency, okay? Omega, that's supposed to be omega. Um, all right, all right, there's one more thing to point out here. So this solution uh, is a cosine, um, and of course, um, cosine, um, cosine of zero is equal to one, uh, but this, the function I've written here is offset uh, from zero, and that's because of this phase factor. Okay, so here is zero uh, in my solution, uh, the first first peak, I should say. Uh, that means uh, where the argument is equal to zero um, for the cosine is over here. Okay, and so it's as if I shifted um, my cosine function from the axis by this distance here. Okay, and this is what the phi, uh, the phase factor does. So this distance is actually uh, minus phi over the frequency. Okay, um, and so uh, that sets this offset. So this uh, factor phi allows us to match the initial condition, what's happening at t equal to zero. Okay. Um, so when you specify a problem like this, you usually have to specify the initial state of the motion, which means not only the position of the mass, but its velocity. Okay, um, and so if I do that, um, my initial position x at time equals to zero um, has to be equal to a cosine of phi. Okay, and my my velocity at time equal to zero, um, going back up to my velocity equation at the top, uh, is minus a omega sine of phi. Okay, and so with these two um, constraints, I can write down what a and phi have to be to solve my motion. Okay, and just to take an example, if I go back to my um, animation here. Uh, so if I imagine here, it's, it's hard in this case to give it an initial velocity. So what I'll do is I'll draw it back uh, 20 centimeters uh, and then let it go. So the initial position is 20 uh, from the equilibrium point, which is at 30. Uh, and then the initial velocity is zero. Okay, and I'll get a motion that uh, will look like that. Uh, and now I can go back to my uh, expressions for x is zero and v is zero. So I set the initial velocity to be zero. So from that I can see um, that that requires phi to be zero because I need v of zero to be zero. So I can either choose a to be zero, which is going to give me a trivial solution that's no oscillation at all, or phi equal to zero. So I get phi equal to zero for that initial condition. And then um, my initial position gives me the amplitude directly in that case. Okay, but of course you can imagine more generic initial conditions that will give you different values of phi and a, um, but this is where they come from. All right, I'll stop there.